Okay, hi and welcome back everybody. Um, historically, a lot of attention to squamous cell carcinoma in FA has been on the head and neck cancers. However, we know that women with FA are at risk for cancers of the genitourinary tract. So here to speak to this is Dr. Katie Pennington from the University of Washington. We are so very lucky to have her knowledge and uh, to share with us today. And um, we thank her for her compassion for our community and just welcome her to this subject. So welcome, Dr. Pennington. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. All right, I will share my screen. Um, okay. Um, so I am a gynecologic oncologist at the University of Washington. So I treat um, cancers of the um, vulva, cervix, vagina, um, as well as um, ovaries and other gynecologic cancers. Um, I'm also on the scientific advisory board for FARF. Um, and thank you again for having me. Oops. Okay, so I have no disclosures. And so um, in this talk, I will um, talk about the risk of gynecologic cancers for individuals with FA. Um, and I will focus on vulvar cancer and cervical cancer, um, and then really focus on what you can do in terms of what I wish that every individual with FA um, would know um, to be able to protect themselves as much as possible. And that includes things like being aware of symptoms to be worried about, um, how to do self exams, which I'll talk a little bit about, um, what should be happening at gynecologic visits, um, and HPV vaccine. And so first some background. Um, I should also say, if you guys have any questions during um, the talk, feel free to type them in the chat. That way I can make sure to get to them at the end because I can't see the chat right now while I'm going over the slides. Um, so first, just to make sure we're all on the same page in terms of anatomy. Um, so this is the vagina. The cervix is the bottom part of the uterus um, right here. So that is one of the cancers that can happen in FA, one of the squamous cell carcinomas, as well as the vagina. Um, the uterus, or what people call the womb, is where a baby would grow, and then the fallopian tubes and the ovaries. And then this is the vulva, or the outside anatomy, um, which we'll go over in more depth. And so um, individuals with FA have an increased risk of anogenital squamous cell carcinomas. These include vulvar cancer, cervical cancer, vaginal cancer, and anal cancer. Um, and vulvar cancer is the most common. Um, and of the FA patients that I've been caring for, this actually has surprised them. I'm finding that many um, individuals know about the cervical cancer risk, but don't know about the vulvar cancer risk. Um, the other thing, just to make sure we're all on the same page, is um, talking about what is HPV, because that's going to be relevant for this talk. So HPV stands for human papillomavirus. Um, it's the most common sexually transmitted infection. It can infect ce cells in the genital area or in the throat and mouth. And there are actually, HPV is not one virus. There are more than 100 different types of HPV. Some of them don't cause any problems at all. Um, some types can cause genital warts. And then other types can cause cancer or precancer. Um, but actually, most types don't cause cancer. Um, HPV is really, really common. More than 80% of us are exposed to HPV during our lifetimes. Um, and in the general prop population, usually the body's immune system gets rid of HPV before it can cause harm. So one of the big questions in the FA community uh, related to squamous cell carcinomas is, are they HPV related? Um, we know that there's an increased risk of developing squamous cell carcinoma in FA, especially the head and neck and anogenital, and both of these sites, it's striking that in the general population, these are cancers where we know HPV causes them. Um, but when we look at um, cases of these types of cancers in FA, studies are conflicting, actually. There have been three studies that looked at this where they tested for HPV. Um, in one study, and these are small numbers, so we have to be a little bit cautious, again, um, about making conclusions when we don't have a lot of numbers. Um, because you could worry that the findings could be due to chance. 
Um, but in one study, HPV was present in 84% of squamous cell carcinomas. That was in uh, 25 cases that they looked at. In another study, though, there were only 9.5% um, positivity and 11% positivity in the other two studies. Um, and so they're, they're, that kind of really called into question whether HPV is important or not. Um, HPV actually may be more prevalent in anogenital cancers than head and neck squamous cell carcinomas. So when I combine all of these studies and break them out by anogenital squamous cell carcinoma versus head and neck, um, HPV was present in 64% of the anogenital squamous cell carcinomas. So that's a significant percentage. And I think that this is still important. Um, and it was only present in 36% of head and neck squamous cell carcinomas. Um, the other thing is I looked at um, all of the cases published in the literature, in the medical literature of anogenital squamous cell carcinoma. Um, there are only 14 cases published where they give details. And so we have a long way to go into learning more about how to best um, do treatment. Um, and that's one of my areas of research as well. Um, in these 14 cases, um, only three of them did they actually test for HPV, because um, this isn't usually part of clinical management. This is like part of research. Um, but in those three cases, two of the three, or two thirds, 66%, were positive for HPV. The other thing I thought was striking in these 14 cases is that many of them, at the time they got diagnosed with their cancer, also had a precancer found either in the same site or a different site. So like if someone had a vulvar cancer, they also had precancer of the vulva, or they might have had a precancer of the cervix and they had the cancer of the vulva. And this occurred in 11 of 14 cases. Um, and these types of precancers, at least in the general population, um, are highly associated with HPV. Um, so this makes me suspicious. Again, we haven't proven it, but I do think HPV is important. Um, and so I will talk about that. Um, but we certainly don't know for sure. So we really need to cover all of our bases when we're um, talking about management. So how is HPV spread? It's spread through um, direct skin-to-skin -skin contact, either through sexual intercourse, oral sex, anal sex, hand to genital contact. Um, you cannot get it from touching an object, for instance, a toilet seat. And risk factors for HPV. Um, so you can get exposed to HPV and one of the risk factors for that would be multiple sexual partners. Um, I should point out, even with just one sexual partner, you can get HPV. Remember, it's, it's really prevalent in our um, environment, you know, so 80% um, of us, again, have been exposed. Um, condoms are partially protective, but not fully protective, um, but still, that's something to consider. Um, and then if you are exposed to HPV, the risk that you can your body can clear it because our immune systems often will fight the HPV and get rid of it, but there are certain things that make it harder for the body to do that. And one is smoking and the other is a weakened immune system. And so um, how can we prevent or decrease risk? Um, condoms, again, can partially decrease the risk um, and HPV vaccination is the other. So the HPV vaccine, um, this is something I think is really important. Um, there are three actually available vaccines. Um, the first two, Gardasil, covers against four types of HPV. Types 6 and 11 are the types that cause warts, not cancer. And then 16 and 18 are the two most common types for cervical cancer. But again, we know there are others that are important. Um, and then Cervarix only covered for 16 and 18. Now we have Gardasil, Gardasil 9, which is a nanovalent vaccine. It covers against nine types. So it covers against the two types that can cause warts, but it covers against seven types that we know can cause cancers. And so um, I would advocate that everyone that's getting the HPV vaccine make sure that they get Gardasil 9 rather than the either of the other two because it will protect you against more types. Um, and if, um, if you have gotten vaccinated against one of the older types, I think it would be appropriate to ask your doctor if you can get the nanovalent vaccine. Um, that's not a recommendation in the general population that people go back and get revaccinated to cover for more types um, necessarily. But for FA, again, where we um, worry about HPV, I would strongly recommend it. 
in the general population, um, they generally recommend that individuals get vaccinated at age to 12. It can be given as early as nine. It's approved for as early as nine and up to age 45. Um, and I would recommend that individuals with FA should receive it at age nine, the earliest age allowed, um, because there are some um, studies suggesting that um, HPV can be present at an earlier age in individuals with FA. We don't know why that is, um, but I would recommend um, getting it at the earliest age. The other thing um, that you want to make sure that your doctor does is in the general population, depending on your age, you can either qualify for two doses versus three, you know, where you're getting one six months apart and, you know, kind of a whole schedule. Um, but for individuals who are immunocompromised, you're supposed to get three doses. We worry that two is not enough. And um, with FA, there can be immunocompromise um, where the immune system doesn't work quite as well. And so I would advocate all individuals with FA get the three doses. Also a reminder that after a bone marrow transplant, um, you have to get re-immunized. Um, and then the other thing just to know is that, um, let's say you already have um, had one type of HPV, um, because sometimes this gets tested for like when you're getting your pap tests and things like, and we know, for instance, you had type 16. Well, there's still a benefit to the vaccine because if you haven't had type 18 or type 33, the vaccine can protect against those other types. Um, so next I'm gonna talk about uh, vulvar cancer. Um, again, this is the most common um, anogenital squamous cell carcinoma in FA. So in the general population, um, there is a 0.3% lifetime risk of getting vulvar cancer. So it's actually pretty rare in the general population. And the average age of diagnosis in the general population is 68 years. So it happens in uh, much older individuals. Um, there are two separate causes of vulvar cancer in the general population. About half is caused by HPV, that the HPV infects the cells that leads to precancers and then cancers. Um, the other half is not HPV related. Um, it tends to be in older women and it's related to chronic inflammation. There are certain skin conditions. Um, there's one called lichen sclerosis that create inflammation and irritation of the vulva that can lead to cancer. So again, even in the general population, we know that, um, that HPV is important, but not important or not a cause for all. So I do think we need to talk about um, when we're thinking about prevention, we need to think about both pathways. Um, in the general population, the majority is diagnosed at an early stage and has an excellent prognosis. Um, the treatment for it is usually surgery, where we remove the vulvar tumor and we remove a few lymph nodes in the groin. Um, early detection in general is really important to minimize the severity of the surgery. Um, and I don't know if you can see my mouse here, but um, so there's a couple reasons for that. One is if you have a smaller cancer, then you can remove less tissue versus if it's a large cancer, you'd have to remove more tissue. And the other thing is there are a lot of really important and critical structures on the vulva. Um, so the clitoris is the organ that is responsible for allowing people to have orgasms. And so, you know, if a lesion is bigger or really near to the clitoris, then there's a risk that the clitoris might need to be removed. Um, the urethral opening, sorry, I've lost my mouse again. The urethral opening right here is where you pee from. Um, and then the anus where bowel movements come from. All of these structures are important. Um, and then, um, you know, if a tumor is so big that the, we, the surgery would be too big, or if it's next to one of these critical structures, sometimes instead of doing surgery, we would do radiation therapy um, as a way of having, that way we could avoid having to remove those important structures. Um, and as you know, radiation therapy is really challenging in FA. Um, so early detection is important in general for anyone with vulvar cancer, but I would say it's especially important for individuals with FA. Um, so I'd like you to know some of the symptoms of vulvar cancer or precancer. So these symptoms can be present with precancer as well. Um, sometimes you don't have any symptoms at all, um, but symptoms like itching in the area or burning or irritation or pain or discomfort. 
or if you had bleeding or discharge um, that was coming from your vulva, so not your period, not bleeding from your monthly menstrual cycle, um, but bleeding or discharge from the vulva, those things would be concerning that I would want you to um, talk to your doctor about. And then the most common way we know if something is going on is actually that you can see an abnormality on the vulva. Um, this might be a lump or a growth. Um, it could be an ulcer or a sore, um, or it can be a patch of skin that is just differently textured or differently colored than the rest of the vulva. And so um, if you notice anything, it's really important um, that you go to your doctor and have them examine it. And so what happens if you do have a finding on the vulva that's not normal? Um, then usually we would do a biopsy to tell us what it is. So we put numbing medicine on the skin um, and then would remove a very small piece of tissue. Um, usually stitches aren't needed and then we can look at that under the microscope so that we know what it is. And vulvar precancer is very treatable. Um, so there are a lot of treatment options in the general population. So you can do surgery with excision where you literally remove the lesion. Um, you can do laser where you destroy the cells. Um, and then sometimes you can do a topical treatment with an immune therapy called Imiquimod or Eldera. And I won't get into this too much unless you guys want to talk about it more, um, but in individuals with FA, excision may be preferred, um, but this really depends on the specific situation. And so some consideration for individuals with FA. Um, so vulvar cancers in FA unfortunately occur at a much younger age, um, often in the 20s. So in that case series that, um, that I looked at of the 14 cases with FA, uh, most of them occurred in their 20s um, or their 30s. Um, the other thing to know is that these vulvar cancers and precancers may grow faster compared to in the general population. And so if you see something, um, please don't put it off. Please get to your doctor early um, so that we can get to treatment quickly. Um, early detection is key. We talked about that already. So number one, if we um, detect a precancer, we can treat it and can prevent cancer altogether. And then, like I already talked about, um, if the cancer is already present, treatment options are better if the tumor is smaller. Um, and so what do, what do I recommend for screening for vulvar cancer and precancers in FA? So an annual GYN exam, we'll talk about for cervical cancer screening that we usually recommend you go to your doctor once a year already anyway. It's really important that they're looking at the vulva. Um, and in my experience, I do have to admit that sometimes doctors are very focused on doing the pap and that they don't spend much time actually looking at the vulva. So I think it's actually good for you to specifically say to your doctor when you go, because they may not know enough about FA, that, you know, I am at increased risk of vulvar cancer. Can you please look at my vulva and make sure that it looks normal? Um, if you happen to have had a precancer um, already diagnosed, then you need those visits more frequently, usually every four to six months. I'm also next going to talk about vulvar self exams. Um, I th there's no guide, national guidelines for this. Um, I think that if you're getting a visit by your doctor once a year, at minimum, it would be ideal for you to do your own exams every six months, so in between those visits. Um, there are some um, people who advocate that all women across the country do monthly exams and they say, well, time it with your period so that you can kind of remember. Um, and so if you're, if you're motivated, I do think it may be beneficial to do it a little bit more than every um, six months, you know, every couple months, or if you just want to get in a pattern doing it monthly, um, but that's up to you. Um, and then paying attention for symptoms and not ignoring them. Um, so let's talk about vulvar self-exams. Um, I want you to start now. Um, and I want you to learn what is normal for you. Um, so the appearance of the vulva is highly vari variable from person to person. So when you do your exams, um, you can kind of get to know what is your normal. That way, then if there's a change, you'll recognize it. Um, and if there are any changes, even if they're, they are small, um, call your doctor. So how to do a vulvar self-exam. Um, so you want to be in a well-lit area. Um, wash your hands. 
and then sit down or stand with one foot propped on a chair or bed and you can hold a handheld mirror in one hand and then you can use the other hand to examine the vulva. Um, another way to do it is actually to put a mirror on the ground and to squat over it. There are a lot of different ways um, to do it. So you can find the way that is most comfortable for you. Um, or some people will ask a, um, a partner if they have one to help them as well. Um, and then when you're examining the vulva, you want to do it both by looking, so looking for changes and also touch or feel. And so you want to systematically check from the top to the bottom. There are a lot of areas of the vulva, vulva and you don't want to miss any. Um, and so starting from the top, and I'll pull up a picture in a second to show the anatomy, you're going to start at the mons pubis. Um, and also, I should say top to bottom, another way to think about that is from the front to the back. So your, your front is, um, you know, your stomach and your back is your back, um, but depending on kind of how you're orienting yourself. And so um, just by looking at the outside, you can see the mons pubis and the folds of the lab labia majora or the outer lips. Um, and here, let me go to a picture of that right now, actually. Um, so, so this here is the mons pubis, and then here are the labia majora, so the, the big lips, what we call them on each side. And then you have the, um, the clitoral hood and the clitoris here. Um, so again, that's the organ that allows people to have orgasms. Um, and then the uh, labia minora, or the little lips, are here. Um, now, in some people, you can't see these structures very well. You can just see the labia majora, and you have to separate the big lips in order to be able to see these, see these structures. Um, so I'll go back to kind of that. So again, you've looked at the mons pubis, just looked at all the areas. I'll talk in a minute about what you're looking for. Um, looked at the folds of the labia majora. And then you can separate the labia majora to see the clitoris in its general area and the labia minora or the inner lips. Then you're going to separate the labia minora to see, and I'll go back to the picture, um, the opening. So this is with the lips separated. So first you'd look on the outside of these, the small lips, and then you'd look on the inside. Um, and you can see the urethral opening. So this is where you pee from, and you'll want to look at all this area in here. Um, and then the vaginal opening here. Um, this here, this picture is showing a hymenal remnant. So the hymen is a little sheet of tissue that, um, that is present. Um, if you've been sexually active, often that you'll just see some remnants and it won't, you know, the opening will be larger. Um, and then this, then last in your exam, you'll look at the perineum. So this is the space between the vagina and the anus. So you'll look for any lesions there. And then lastly, the anus. So, and so what are you looking for? Um, you're looking for changes in appearance. So you're looking for a new mole or wart or lump or other growth. Um, you're looking for cuts or sores and you're looking for a change in skin color. Um, you're also looking for changes in feel of the skin. So again, as you're looking at each area, you kind of want to feel it. Um, if you feel a thickened skin or a raised area, that would be concerning. Um, doesn't mean it's precancer or cancer, but it could be. So you would want to get it checked out. And pay close attention to any areas where you feel pain or itching or other discomfort. And while you're looking at each area, just apply some very gentle pressure to the skin to check for any lumps. Okay. Um, so this picture is just to remind people that there's a wide variety of appearances of vulvas. So if I'm talking about vulvar exams, I don't want to cause alarm when you look at your own vulva if you're worrying is this normal or not. Um, it can be normal to have some asymmetry. Sometimes people will have one uh, lip on one side be slightly bigger than the other. And I'm just showing on these pictures, you know, in, in some pictures you just see the labia majora on the outside. Sometimes you can see the labia minora. This is looking from front on. Um, the labia minora can be much longer or wider or more prominent. Sometimes they can be a slightly different color than the rest. And again, everyone has different skin colors. Um, and then this is a view kind of looking um, with the legs separated again. You can just see that there are a wide variety of appearances, um, which is why it's important for you to uh, know what's normal for your own vulva. Um, I would, with your permission, like to show some pictures of some concerning lesions, some examples, so you know what to look for. Um, 
I'm, I have this blank right now before putting up pictures because if this is triggering for anyone, then I would invite you to close your eyes and I will let you know when we're done. I just have a couple slides. Um, I also am not putting up any pictures of cancers. I'm just putting up some pictures of things that can be pre-cancer. Um, so at this point, if you do not want to see this, um, go ahead and close your eyes and I'm gonna advance the slide. So these are a couple of pictures of some things that I would find concerning. So in this picture on the left, sometimes a lesion can be whitish or paler in color compared to the surrounding skin. Um, it can also be darker. Sometimes it will be um, black or brown or even a slight bluish in color. Um, and even you can have lesions that are red. You can see kind of this lesion compared to the rest of the skin is, um, is red. And it's kind of a discrete lesion as well as some whitening there. Um, and then this slide is just showing some other, so you can have kind of darkening lesions, but you can also have raised lesions. It's a little bit subtle in this picture on the left, but you can see on the right more, these spots here are slightly raised. And if you felt them, they would feel a little bit raised compared to the rest of the skin. So again, when you're checking, um, you're looking both for color changes, but also for changes in the skin texture and thickness. Okay, um, with that, I'm done, I'm done with the pictures if anyone was looking away. Um, I think before I go to cervical cancer, I'm gonna go to the Q&A right now and just see what questions there were so far. Um, um, so first question I see um, by um, Faith. Um, so do you recommend that the three doses of HPV vaccine, even if you are not currently immunocompromised? Um, so my answer to that is yes. There, there may be some that disagree. Um, but even um, in FA, the, there is a concern that your immune system is not functioning totally normally um, compared to in the general population, even if you're not frankly what people consider immunocompromised. Um, and I think there's very little harm. I mean, it is inconvenient to have to get a third dose, um, but there's not harm to you to get an extra dose if you didn't need it. Whereas if you only get two doses and it doesn't optimally protect you, um, that would be disadvantageous. So I personally would recommend um, three doses. Now, if you've already had the vaccine, you know, before, like let's say you've had it a couple of years ago and you got the two doses, um, I'm not necessarily saying you have to go back and get the third dose. Um, you know, you'd probably have to get the whole series again, just with the way that it's, it's given. Um, but it's just something that I think when you're um, considering um, in order to, um, uh, like if you're, if you haven't had it yet, I, I would recommend the three doses. Um, the next question was, is laser an option to treat vulvar cancers? Um, laser is not an option to treat cancer. Um, it can be an option to treat pre-cancers. Um, one of the things that I didn't get into, um, and you don't really have to keep track of this, this is a job for your doctor to think about these issues, is that um, if someone has a precancer and you remove it, kind of like, you know, make an incision with a scalpel and remove it, then you can look at that tissue under the microscope and you can check to make sure that they don't see any cancer. So like even if you had a biopsy before, um, then when you remove the whole lesion, they can make sure there's no cancer and you don't want to miss a cancer. And so anytime, if, if a doctor has any concern that there could be cancer in a lesion, it's more appropriate to remove it completely with an excision rather than destroy it with a laser because you don't get that information. Um, I would argue that for individuals with um, FA, um, they, that, um, um, since the risk of cancer is higher, in general, I may be more comfortable um, getting tissue, especially if it's a first-time diagnosis, to rule out a cancer completely. Um, but that's a pretty nuanced discussion. Um, all right. At this point, I'm going to go on with um, cervical cancer, and then we will, um, and then I will keep answering more of the questions. Thank you. These are great questions. I appreciate it. Okay. So let's talk about cervical cancer next. So again, this is a reminder, this is the, um, the uterus and the cervix is the bottom part of the uterus. Okay, so in the general population, we know that most cervical cancer is caused by HPV. So we've talked about how in FA, we don't know if that's true or not, but in the general population, we know that that's true. 
And so symptoms of cervical cancer, um, you may not have any symptoms at all, especially when it's early, which will speak to why screening and going to your doctor is important. Um, if you have a symptom, the most common symptom is abnormal vaginal bleeding. Um, so this can be bleeding in between your periods, um, bleeding after sex, um, or if you've gone through menopause, bleeding after menopause. And then you can sometimes have other symptoms such as um, abnormal vaginal discharge um, or pelvic pain. Um, obviously, these symptoms do not mean you have a cervical cancer. They can be caused by other things, but again, these can sometimes be symptoms that occur with cancer. So in the general population um, for cervical cancer screening, um, they're screening not just for cervical cancer, but most importantly, looking for precancer. Again, our goal is to find precancers that we can prevent from turning into cancers. And there are two main screening tests that we use. There's the PAP test or PAP smear. So the PAP, it's called that because it was invented by George Papanikolaou. Um, and then the HPV test or human papillomavirus. The fact that PAP is in this name is a complete coincidence. Um, these are two separate tests. And so first, I'm just going to talk to you about what the pap test is. So um, in the pap test, the speculum is placed to look at the cervix. So again, this is the cervix here. So if you place a speculum in the vagina, you would, this is what you would see. This is the view of the cervix that you would see. And then there's a swab done. There are a couple different ways to swab the cervix, but there's a swab of the cervix to just collect cells superficially um, with a brush. And then those cells are looked at under the microscope um, and it, the, the pathologist is looking for precancerous or cancer cells. Um, now, this is not the same as doing a biopsy. A biopsy is where you're not just brushing cells off the surface, but you're actually taking a piece of tissue of the surface and a slightly deeper underneath. And that is much easier for pathologists to tell what is going on. So again, this pap test where they're doing the brushing and looking under the microscope is a screen. Um, and it gives us important information. Um, but, um, but if it's concerning, then there's more work that we have to do. So some frequent misunderstandings in the community. So the pap test is not the same as a pelvic exam. Um, all the time I see women who think they have had a pap, but they didn't, like when we went to look to try to get the records. So if you have a pelvic exam, even if a speculum gets placed, it doesn't mean that you had a pap smear. Remember, a speculum is just allows us to look at the cervix, but if they didn't do a swab where they collected cells and then sent them to the pathologist, you didn't have a pap smear. So it's important to ask your doctor what, it, what has been done. Um, and then um, the other thing is a pap test is not, oh, and so just kind of following up on that, I sometimes see people who think, well, I've gone to my doctor every year, so surely I've had a pap. But again, that may or may not be true. You just want to know, um, and they should be telling you if they're doing it. Um, and then the other thing, again, is the pap test is not the same thing as an HPV test. So sometimes people get a pap sent, but they don't send HPV at the same time, um, or sometimes both can be sent at the same time. So let me talk about the HPV test next. So the HPV test um, is a test that tests for specific strains of HPV that can cause cervical cancer. So remember we talked about how there's more than 100 strains of HPV, but we know there are certain ones that are more problematic or have more risk for cancer than others. And this HPV test can test for many of those. Um, so it's the same process as a pap test, so a speculum where you then swab the cervix, and it can be sent at the same time as the pap, remember where the cell's getting sent to the microscope. So again, a pap looks for precancers or cell changes on the cervix that might become cervical cancer if not treated appropriately. An HPV test looks for the virus that can cause those cell changes. So there are two different tests, but they both give us important information. And so what happens if the PAP is abnormal or HPV is positive? So in the general population, this really depends on the specific result. You can have a lot of different findings. Um, usually if there are mild changes, then um, you would repeat the PAP and HPV test sooner than usual. Many mild abnormalities can go away on their own over time without ever causing cervical cancer. Um, but you need to monitor to make sure that they do go away or that they're not worsening. 
Um, if there are more significant changes, then we recommend a cervical colposcopy. Ah, I can't talk. A cervical colposcopy. Um, so a cervical colposcopy, again, is a speculum exam, but then we're looking at the cervix under magnification or what we call a colposcope. So, um, and then some, and often the doctor will put a dilute vinegar on the cervix. That vinegar can make abnormal cells turn white. So it's easier to see the abnormal cells when we're looking under the microscope. And if they see any abnormalities, then they may take small biopsies of the cervix to look at those um, to tell us kind of what's causing the changes. So it's important to know cervical precancer, again, is very treatable. Um, Low-grade changes often resolve on their own over time, and so they don't necessarily need treatment. Um, sometimes they do, but often they don't. And just um, usually repeat PAP and HPV for follow-up is recommended. Um, if there are high-grade changes, then we do want to treat these um, to prevent them from turning into a cancer and also to make sure there couldn't, that there isn't a cancer already present. So usually this is in the form of a leap or a cone biopsy. Um, so again, if this is the cervix here, um, what that does is it removes a small portion of the cervix, the outer cervix, but also that inner canal where there can be some abnormalities. So in this view, it would look like this. You'd still have normal cervix remaining behind. And that's, it's called a cone because it's kind of a cone shape. And then that procedure both can treat it, it can remove all the abnormalities, but also it allows us to see a little bit deeper into the canal to make sure there isn't a cancer that needs to be addressed. So it's a diagnosis and a treatment. Um, so I want to give you, you won't need to keep track of all these guidelines for how we screen for cancer in the general population because they are different for you if you have FA, but I do want to talk to you about them a little bit so that you can understand why we need to treat you differently than someone in the general population. Um, and because your doctor also may not be an expert in FA and you may need to um, educate them about why these guidelines aren't appropriate. So um, way back when, when the PAP was invented and you know, we had these, what I call the old guidelines um, where people used to recommend that every, um, every female get a PAP once a year starting at the age of 18 or at the age of first intercourse. Um, now we do it much, more, um, much less frequently and we start later. So things that we've learned are that cervical cancer in the general population again is rare in the very young. So starting at 18 is probably not necessary. Um, cervical precancer and ultimately cancer develops very slowly over many, many years, sometimes decades. And so we've learned that if you screen less frequently, you're likely still going to be able to pick up these precancers before they turn into cancer. So you have time to do something about it. And then we've also learned, again, at first PAP, we had PAP, but we didn't have the HPV test. But we've learned that the HPV test is very effective, again, in the general population to distinguish between higher and lower risk. And that if the HPV is negative, that it's safe to space out the PAP tests even further. And so the new guidelines, and I say new because they're not really new anymore, um, are that people get a PAP every three years between the age of 21 to 29. And then starting at the age of 30, you get a PAP and HPV. And that if both of those are normal, you can space out the testing to every five years. Um, we recommend that people get screened even if they've had the HPV vaccine, because the HPV vaccine doesn't protect you against all of the types of HPV. Um, and if someone has had a hysterectomy where the cervix got removed, then um, those individuals don't need to have swabs of the vagina um, unless they had prior precancer of the cervix or a prior history of cancer. All right, so now we have the newest guidelines. And so if you go to your gynecologist, you may uh, be seeing them, some people using the uh, regular guidelines I just showed you, um, but these newest guidelines are out and available that are, some, that are called HPV based. So um, instead of relying on the PAP, they actually recommend uh, relying on the HPV because that's how good we think it is at distinguishing high and low risk. Um, and they recommend um, not starting until the age of 25 and doing HPV every five years. So why do these guidelines work in the general population? Again, the underlying principles that shape this is that cervical cancer is uncommon in the very young, 
that cervical cancer is very slow to develop and that most cervical cancer is caused by HPV. And so do these guidelines apply to individuals with FA? Well, I would say no. And um, most experts in FA also agree that you can't use the general guidelines because we know that anogenital squamous cell carcinomas unfortunately can happen at a younger age. Um, they may develop more quickly. Um, and we don't know if these cancers, all of them are caused by HPV or not. So, so if you have FA, we recommend an annual pap starting at age 18 or age of first intercourse. And we usually recommend sending the HPV test at the same time as a pap. And again, there's no formal guidelines out there about that. And there are a lot of uh, nuances um, to how to do this, but this is, this is what we're recommending. Um, so some take home points. Again, um, I recommend the HPV vaccine. Um, I recommend it be the Gardasil 9 that is, um, covers against the most types. Um, I want you to remember that cervical cancer screening guidelines in the general population don't apply to individuals with FA. Um, and that I recommend an annual GYN exam, a PAP with HPV and a vulvar exam every year. Um, I recommend doing vulvar self exams and being aware of symptoms. So at this point, I will um, take time for questions. I'm gonna pull up the, um, pull up the chat and thank you guys so much um, for, your, um, for your attention. Okay, so um, the, the first question here, and then I'm also okay if people wanna unmute themselves unless our moderators don't recommend that, um, but um, I'm okay with people unmuting themselves if they wanna talk too. Um, if I'm in, yeah. yeah, we can go ahead and do that. Okay, perfect. Um, it'll just be a little bit more, um, more collaborative. So, all right. Um, a question on the comments. Um, if I'm in menopause, is it a good decision to take out my ovaries and uterus to avoid the cancer risks? Um, thank you for that question. That's a really great question. Um, so generally, we don't recommend that you have surgery to remove the ovaries and uterus, except in certain circumstances. Um, so, um, number one, remember that the uterus is a whole organ and that cervix is only part, um, but we generally think that doing this careful screening that we can pick up these cancers and there are risks to having a hysterectomy. Um, so I would not necessarily say that you should just have a hysterectomy if you haven't been having problems. Um, if you're having a lot of problems with precancers, then sometimes that is something that we would talk about with you. Um, the question about the ovaries is a really, uh, a really good one. Um, the individuals with FA, you know, regardless of um, type, we tend to think are at in increased risk of anogenital squamous cell carcinomas, um, which doesn't include the ovaries. There are certain Fanconi anemia genotypes. So for instance, BRCA2, um, if you have a mutation in BRCA2 that do put you at increased risk of ovarian cancer. And in those instances, um, you would be recommended put to get rid of your ovaries to decrease the risk of cancer. Um, that's kind of a whole, nother, um, a whole nother discussion, but not every individual with FA has an increased risk of ovarian cancer, only certain ones do. So that's a, a good thing to know about what type of FA you have is so that you can find out if you're at increased risk or not. Um, next question is, can you have vaginal neuropathy? Um, you know, I do know of some individuals where they think that the pain is being caused by the nerves that supply the vagina. Um, that's not very common. And I would definitely want to, you know, want that person to get evaluated to make sure that they don't think something else is going on. Um, that's not very common. Um, but I do believe that it can happen. Um, another question is, is it normal to have a lot of pelvic pain after an orgasm? Um, 
So um, I would want to, and, and I should specify here, I want to answer as many questions as I can. Um, I want to be really careful that I can answer um, general questions, but I can't give like specific medical advice because often when I'm giving medical advice, it's after having interviewed someone for a half hour and really asking it very detail about lots and lots of things and doing an exam. So I would be hesitant. Um, I can't really give you specific advice, you know, if you're asking about for you, but I can kind of talk in some generalities. So just have to say that. Um, is it normal to have a lot of pelvic pain after an orgasm? Um, I would want to know more to be able to give advice about that. Um, I think um, many people don't necessarily have pain after an orgasm, so I would want to hear more details about it. Um, and then I would, I would also want to know kind of is it the pain like right after an orgasm or with the orgasm um, or is it pain um, because of sex? Sometimes people can have um, soreness or vaginal dryness that makes, um, makes them feel sore after sex. Um, and there can be conditions that can make sex painful. And so I definitely want you to see your gynecologist um, for more evaluation about this. All right, the next question. Um, I was recommended to have a hysterectomy because I've had a child and had many precancers. Um, I just had a pap um, slash biopsy and the value was NIL and um, for HPV. Um, does this mean I don't have HPV anymore? Um, thanks. This, that's a, a great question. So um, I, there are a couple different ways to answer that. Um, we know that someone, if they have HPV, that the immune system can sometimes clear it um, for, um, you know, where then, then you don't have it anymore. We don't fully know that we can say that you don't have HPV because what if the test just didn't pick it up perfectly that time? Or what if your immune system is suppressing it, but then it can flare later? So I don't feel like I would ever, especially for someone with FA, be able to confidently say that you don't have HPV anymore. Um, but we do know that there are instances where someone can clear their HPV. Um, I'd feel better and better if you've had more tests where you had negative HPV and persistently had negative HPV with your test also. Um, does that answer your question? All right, I'll keep, I'll keep going, but if you want to ask more, um, you know, type, type more. Um, all right. Uh, this is Diane Pearl, uh, mother of Alexandra, age 25, post-transplant and vulvar cancer. What is your recommendations on hormone therapy? And if yes, what kind? Um, that, is a, um, that is a really, uh, a really great question, a really important one. Um, it depends on kind of why you're asking about hormone uh, um, hormone therapy. So if, if you're asking if someone kind of went into um, menopause early um, or if they had a surgery that um, caused them to go into menopause because they had their ovaries removed. Um, th hormone therapy, I will just admit, is kind of outside as a GYN oncologist that treats cancers, um, is a little bit outside of my expertise for, for young um, individuals with FA. Um, I hope to be building that expertise, but right now, I'm sorry, I can't be super helpful on like specific recommendations for that. Um, another question, do you recommend annual colorectal doctor anal check after having vulvar cancer? That is a great question, um, especially if someone has had a cancer that was very close to the anus then I do think it is a good idea to have either a colorectal doctor or your GYN oncologist may have expertise to actually look inside the anus as well um, with something called an anoscope where they can just separate the anus and look inside the canal. And I do recommend that. Um, but if, if someone has had a vulvar cancer, um, you know, very far away, like up towards the clitoris. Um, we don't necessarily recommend that for every patient, but it's not wrong to have it done either um, in terms of being cautious. All right. Um, the question is, the once a year PAP and HPV test is recommended from 18 or age of sexual active. Do you still recommend an annual test if not yet sexually active, um, age 30 plus? That is a great question. Um, I do still recommend an annual PAP, um, even if someone isn't sexually active, um, because we have not, um, 
fully answer this question about HPV, and we worry that some cancers could arise not from HPV, meaning I think that there could be some people who have never been sexually active that could still get cancer. And so swabbing those cells and looking them at them under the microscope is a way, a way to identify abnormalities. So I would still um, recommend um, that. Other questions? Ah, thank you. Um, do outer hemorrhoids in the anus, um, can they be a sign of possible cancers or be misdiagnosed? Um, so that, that's a tough one because hemorrhoids are really, really common. So I don't want to raise alarm um, because many people have hemorrhoids that absolutely are not cancers. Um, but you bring up a really good point that I, I have met some um, individuals in the past where they were told by a doctor who didn't have expertise um, that something was a hemorrhoid and they didn't really get a careful exam um, to know that it actually was a cancer. Um, things that I'm looking for when I'm doing the exam, a hemorrhoid has a really characteristic appearance, but you know, it's soft, it's squishy, it's not firm um, or nodular. Um, there are kind of characteristic appearances. Um, but when in, when in doubt, if there's any question, it's appropriate to get a biopsy. Um, and I would also say just if you have um, a hemorrhoid and it's very severe or something just doesn't make sense, you know, ask again. Um, but I think that's a tricky one again, because I don't want to raise alarm about something that's a really common condition. Um, but you're correct that sometimes hemorrhoids can be misconfused or misdiagnosed. So um, Faith is asking, do you think that they look at the anal area thoroughly during a colonoscopy? Um, I would say um, they, they should be looking at it as they're going in, and they do look as they go in to see if there are internal hemorrhoids and things like that, um, but, um, but their focus is the colon. Um, if you've had um, precancers of the perianal area, like on the outside, then you usually need a different procedure than just the colonoscopy where the, remember I told you that they, um, for instance, like when we look at the cervix, they put vinegar on it, a dilute vinegar to make the cells turn white. Um, we can do the same thing on the vulva when we're evaluating for precancers. And you can actually do the same thing inside the anal canal. And so that's called an anoscopy or a high, high resolution anoscopy where you would have an expert to do that. So a colonoscopy does not do that, but they are looking with a camera as they go in and making some observations. Okay, are you familiar with the medication Intra Rosa and is it safe for FA patients? Um, I am peripherally, um, let me just kind of remind myself, I'm peripherally familiar with Intra Rosa as a way of treating um, vaginal dryness, um, but I don't know if I can tell you specifically for FA, unfortunately. So, um, prasterone, yeah. So um, I don't, I don't have a reason to think that that wouldn't be safe for FA patients um, necessarily. But obviously, there are a lot of, um, there's a lot we don't know about FA. But I think that it would be reasonable. All right. Um, I have tried to have a colposcopy without sedation and found it extremely painful. Um, is this normal? Um, I would say that um, that colposcopy, um, everyone can have a very uh, different experience. Um, and yes, there, there are some individuals that do great with it. And often it can be done in the office where we um, place the speculum and can put a little numbing medicine on the cervix and do a biopsy. Um, but there definitely are individuals where they can find this um, very uncomfortable. And sometimes it is reasonable um, to go to the OR where they can um, make you more sleepy um, and to control your pain to be able to do the procedure. That is absolutely reasonable um, if you've tried without and or not. Not, not doing well. It does not mean that there's something wrong with you or your anatomy if you're having trouble with that. There are definitely individuals that have a hard time with it. Um, Blanche is asking if I can talk about early menopause issues. Um, and I don't have a lot of expertise on that as much. Um, was there a specific question that you wanted to know about, Blanche?
I'll let I'll let um, let her type if she has more issues. I um, I can talk in general about early menopause a little bit um, in the general population, but in terms of how it relates to FA and the specific endocrino endocrinopathies, um, that's an area where I still need to expand my expertise. Um, and then Faith is asking, do you think we should be asking our GYN to do those extra checks with vinegar and such routinely? Um, that is a great question. I do not recommend that everyone have the, um, the vinegar done routinely. Um, if you were having um, significant itching or a symptom, then I would want your doctor to put the vinegar on to be able to look at it. Um, and it's not, it's something I didn't talk about in this talk, but if someone is having um, itching or irritation or pain in an area, and when the doctor looks, it looks normal to them. Um, sometimes they will recommend a cream like a steroid treatment or estrogen cream or other things, um, what we would call an empiric treatment, meaning we don't know why you're having the itching, um, but if it doesn't get better, um, you know, but we're going to try this to see if we can treat it. Um, if, um, if it's really critical that if you try one of those things um, and, um, and it's not helping, then you need a biopsy. Um, and I would say that for individuals with FA, your doctor should have a low threshold to do that biopsy much sooner compared to um, people in the general population. Um, so I would say in general, your doctor, Faith, should have a low threshold to look with vinegar if they're worried that there's an abnormality. Um, but if you're just going for a routine exam, not having any symptoms, and the whole vulva looks normal, you really don't need that vinegar to be applied. That's really to kind of um, aid in diagnosis of specific issues. And Blanche, I'll, I'll look forward to talking with you later. Thanks. Okay, are there um, other, um, other questions? All right, well, thank you so much, all of you. It was uh, nice talking with you. Um, I should also, um, I also just want to let you know that there is a video up about um, our research in vulvar cancers and anogenital squamous cell carcinomas. Um, this recently got funded by the FARF and we're going to be collecting more information so that hopefully we will better be able to treat individuals with FA who develop these cancers. Um, so I would invite you to um, check out that video and if you have any questions, please reach out to me.